Okay, everyone. So my name is Francis. I'm the HQ engineer for fall of 2022 for circuits one. Um, I do apologize that this review uh, is being recorded the two days prior to your guys' meeting too. This is the uh, date of uh, November 8th, exactly at 8.06 p.m. at night. I'll be covering over two problems from the previous midterm that will essentially be covering a lot of what is going to be met, covered as according to Dr. Russell during the lecture that was uh, that he mentioned today. So I'll be covering over specifically a name problem, which will then be related to militants and not militants, specifically evidence. And uh, the next problem is actually going to be a main problem using a steady state expression. And from there, I'll go ahead and cover the basics of how to convince inductors and capacitors that that, that that could potentially be covered on the exam as well. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and get started. First problem we have here is a Simmons problem. So, from what we can see, there's one pretty straightforward circuit. We have a bunch of uh, current sources. We're trying to find Thevenin's equivalent. So, at the moment I see Thevenin's, I think of many. That's why I think of first. And so let's go ahead and look at what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get into an equivalent voltage source and a equivalent moving resistor. So first thing I like to do is go ahead and kind of just see how well. Give me one second. If there's an echo, in there. I'm seeing that. There we go. All right, we are back. All right, about the echo. I'm not sure if we're going to take it down. Either way, let's continue. The first thing I like doing for me, I mean for me, is essentially just seeing how well I remember how to use seconds up. So why we can use them and do before. So for the end one, all I'm just looking for is essentially the diagonal elements of writing them outside of the actual matrix. So for the end one, I see G1 and G2 and G3 being connected to it directly. G1 may not be as, as obvious, but it still is a element we have to factor in and wanting to find our sum. So V1 is going to be equal to G1 plus G2 plus G3 for our diagonal element inside the mean. Moving on to node 2, let's look at it. It's going to be G3, G4, and G5. That one is a lot more straightforward than, than node 1. So let's go and write that in. Three, four, five, and then last but not least, there's a node still so we out here. It's going to be VN3. Well, this one's pretty pretty straightforward as well, in my opinion. That is just going to be G5. So only an element there. So VN3 is just going to be equal to five. Now that we have our diagonal elements, so let's go and actually write up. Diagonal mean lines. So it's going to be, I'm going to write it out just to show everyone numbers and where they come from. And our last row is just going to be B5. So now I'm using the passive convention. So everything that is being shared is going to be considered as a negative. So let's go ahead and look at this now. So we know for between node one and node two, G3 is being shared between the two. So let's make that our negative between the two. And then for node one to node three, there's no direct path. There's nothing being shared between them. So we label that as zero. Now for node two, we already know between node two, node one, G3, is being shared between them, hence why you put G3 in the first uh, in the first cell of row two. But now let's look at between node two and node three. Where is G5? And that is why we put the negatives here and there. So that is our first map. And then we know we want to find the values are the vector for our nodes, being one, two, and three. 
And lastly, I'm going to write the full sources first, meaning I'm going to combine uh, my independent and dependent sources first, just to write that out. Make sure that I'm able to not only write it out, but also able to break it apart. So for node one, there's only there's two, three actually sources we need to attach to, you could say. It's JG1, DMD5, and alpha I, I1, where two are dependent sources and JG1 is our independent, our independent source. So we know JG1 plus DMD5, since we're going for a passive convention. And since our passive means going in is positive, going out is negative, that is why whenever you look at I4, the direction is coming out of V1, making that our negative. Alpha I4. Now moving on to node two. Well, node two, there's only one source we need to look at, and it's our dependent source up here. But notice how the current and how it's traveling is going into node two, making it positive for node two at least. So we're going to say alpha I1 and I4. And now, so this is where the analysis comes in. This is where Thevenin's comes in. With Thevenin's, our goal is to get this circuit, all of this right here, equal to Below the voltage source and some load component in series. That's what this is covering. So, to follow the analysis, we have to go ahead and apply a source of cross, I should say, A and B, where this is J naught. And to make, and for simplicity's sake, we can label it as one. You could simply change this value to whatever you feel comfortable with, but nine times out of ten, it's going to be easier to just go ahead and use one amp. If it was Norton's though, say we were using Norton's, okay? The quick side note for Norton's, the goal is to use many, meaning you want everything to be in multi source instead. And you apply a load of a, a voltage load instead. So instead of current, you will be applying a load of a voltage source as your terminals A and B. Or this is just V naught, and you can label it as one volt. This isn't this problem though. This problem is specifically talking about the benzene equivalent, where you apply a current load, a current source load across from A and B. So knowing that, applying it, we know now B and 3 isn't zero in terms of having any sources. It's actually our J naught value, which is going to be here. And that's what we have for our general main, I mean main equation for now. Copy it over, move on to the next page. And we have this. Don't forget, here is a load here going up. So, I'm going to really quickly paste this here. Please scale up. Oh, okay. So, from here, I want to go ahead and break up our sources now into their respective vectors. And now, we this apart. So we know, for example, we know for our independent sources, JG1, no independent sources connecting to node 2, VN2. There is our J naught for VN3. That's our independent sources. Now, Moving over to our dependent sources. This one may not be as clear. Or it probably is to, as clear for some of you folk, but just to explain, there are two sources here and here. It's specifically attached to VN1 and VN2. VN3 
is under effect by our known independent source. This right here is not a dependent source. We do not consider it as one. It is a independent source. In this case, a current source has seven means calls for that. So for now, let's go ahead and separate it out. Here. This is going to be June E5 minus alpha I4. Our for VN2 is, is just going to be alpha I4. And for VN3, there's no dependent source connected to it. So we say that as zero. Now, we need to get E5 and I4 in terms of our nodes. Well, let's look at them. So here is V5, and guess what? V5 is related to G5, our component 5 right here. So what I like looking at is really one understanding of my convention. In this case, it's passive. We meaning anything going in to a component is positive, and anything going out is negative. With that in mind, passive convention usually indicates our node across any you know, voltage across any specific element is usually going to be flowing from high to low, as in just a difference between your your nodes, you just have to identify how exactly. In this case, for V5, between nodes, we know it's going to be VN2 and VN3, but how exactly? We look at our polarity. The polarity is there for a reason. Please use it. It's Dr. Russell's way of giving you a hint on how to work the polynomial. In this case, V5 is specifically equal to Vn2 minus Vn3. And then I4, well, we know I4 source, the dependent source is up here, and it's related to V4. So the biggest thing I want to highlight is the direction of what, how it's flowing. So I4 is flowing down from Vn2, meaning it came out from here. What does this mean? According to our convention, it's flowing out of Vn2, meaning it's positive. So we know I4 is just equal to Vn2. So with this in mind now, let's go ahead and write it out. So we know now our dependence for our independent and independent sources is going to be JV1, 0, J0, naught plus GM, V5 is now equal to VN2 minus VN3 minus alpha, it's not alpha, but I was trying to write a positive Johnson, my bad. It's going to be Alpha G4 VN2. This is not going to be, if you look up real quick, is going to be alpha I4, where I4 is just equal to right here. Let me just make sure. Oh, yes, I do make a mistake box. I never asked you to comment for that. So alpha I4. is still going to be related to our factor of the uh, 4.2 and same thing for GM. GM where GM's equal to two Siemens and alpha, as I said, is just going to be equal to 4.2 amps. But the issue is here that I4 is still equal to VN, VNT. But I made a mistake of forgetting to include our G4. As we're looking for current, this right here is still current. All of it is still in terms of current sources. Why well, stated earlier, this VN5, I mean, I4 is equal to VN2, doesn't quite make sense if we're trying to work in voltage, I mean, current sources. So, what would we do to comment for that? 
multiplied by the conductance of the connecting component or the original component of what you're trying to find. Since this is current across a component, it's G4, we're going to use G4. So now this is now correct right here. Is this still gets us current? As we know, current equals is equal to voltage divided by our, our resistance. So V times G, also known as just V divided by R, is valid. I just said earlier, this is like voltage is this much. Not voltage. Current is equal to V over R, or also known as V times G. Conductance is just equal to V in Just a quick one that's made for. Okay. So, you guys have been working with name and name, or well, specifically name for a while. So, now our goal is here to get this independent vector in terms of our sources. We'll also create a map times our node vectors, our node points, our money in this case, there's three. Just to go and create a map. A matrix, I should say, that gets us this this output of our dependent sources. So let's figure it out. How I like starting that off is simply by looking at our nodes and specifically node our node voltages. So, for example, in row one, I see VN two, VN three being used. There's no VN one though. So that's a good indicator that for our dependent matrix, it's going to be zero VN one. There's no factor of it being used in the first row, meaning when we multiply it by our vector of our node voltages, it's not going to be used. There's zero of it there. But that doesn't apply to VN2 and VN3. They're being used. Well, let's figure out how exactly. So we know VN2 is going to be used in both our elements in 2 and 3, cell 2 and 3, in our first row. But not VN3. VN3 is only being used in our first element here. So we know a couple things from that. We know that for our GM, it's still going to be the same, it's just a factor of it. GM is going to be applicable to both cases. How exactly, though, we will find out soon. And then now we know there is an alpha of VN2 times G4 of our node voltage 2 used in both slots, meaning it does exist for. In in row one, columns two and three, here and here. But wait, why am I writing GM3 in row one, column three? Well, it's because we need to cancel it out somehow. And by canceling out, I mean, if you notice in this, this equation right here, the one I'm referring to specifically is VN2 minus VN3 of alpha G4 VN2. There is VN2 being used in both of them, but not VN3. This needs to be canceled out somehow. The way you cancel that out is if we were to distribute it, we need to get rid of the GM that would appear here by simply adding a negative of it. And that is how you generate the first row of our dependent matrix to get for our analysis. So moving on to row two, using the same kind of thought process, same method, we notice a couple of things. There's only VN2. Well, that means, guess what? VN1 and VN3 aren't going to be used. So, look at VN2. Well, how that's being used, you could just essentially take it out. You would take it out. When I say take it out, I mean just factor it. You know, this would show what I'm saying. G4. I mean, this right here, the alpha being used right here, times G4 is going to apply here as well. Okay, so we're not writing Laplace. Okay, I've, I've seen delta, seen a lot of things. I'm trying to write alpha. There you go. And then row row three, it's just a zero all the way across. There's no there's no no voltage being used, and that is our 
map our matrix for our dependent sources in terms of our node voltages. So now, from here, this is what we do. We know that we have to take this and subtract it from our original map that we generated, which is this right here. So let's go ahead and do that. And just to save a little time and a little less than intermediate steps, this is what we'll do. G1 plus G2 plus G3. And here, I'm going to go and take out the negative just to show you a little bit. It would be G3 plus GM minus alpha G4. And this variable is GM because when you multiply it, not multiply it, when you combine the two, maps together, this is how it would come out to be. Second row, G3. G3 plus G4 plus G5 minus alpha G4 with a negative G5 as again. I want to point out there's nothing of elements all the way of our U essentially. There's little yields of zeros that won't affect our terms in those positions. That's why if you compare it to up here, we're keeping a lot of it the same. We want it the same. We're just adjusting a couple of things. Ball left hand is still zero. Middle column right here, G5. And the right hand column is just going to be G3. All this times our no voltages, our vector of it, equal to AG1, zero, and GMX. Well, from here, we know we can go a couple a couple ways. So first, I'm gonna go ahead and copy this over to the next page. Copy it a page here, and then we're going to paste this. Paste. Let's go down there. Hey, so we know. We're going to break this up one last time. So, yeah, we're going to break it up one last time into our load source and our independent source that's already on the server. Okay, so this is where the new portion of it, what you guys are unfamiliar with. So, Devonins and Orsons. Very once when you're at this step right here where you have an equivalence of how you taking care of your dependent sources related to your current your mesh currents or your or your node voltages and now you're trying to figure out well what do i do next so from here this is what you do you solve for vm but both ways where in this case to the specific problem we're shorting j naught to zero and we're going to be shorting JG1 to zero as well to see uh, how our circuit behaves in both cases. Now let's go ahead and apply that. See what I mean when I'm saying that. So first, I'm going to real quick write our equivalent out for our map. So this would be six, one point two, two, negative one, negative point two, negative two. 0, negative 2, 2 times our vector of our node voltages, in this case VN1, VN2, VN3, equal to our known current source, our independent current source that was originally on our circuit, and then the one we attached onto it as according to Kepfenden's equivalencies. So now this is what I mean. So for case one, okay, I guess you could say for case one, we're going to say j naught is equal to, to zero. So that means between our two vectors, j naught has now changed from a one to a zero. So we are only using our independent source originally. That's what we'll be solving for. So this is what our matrix is going to be using essentially. We'll be doing 
same exact map we, we created earlier together. 1.2 to 2, negative 2 to here, negative 2 to here, and then the negative 0.2, all of this times unit 1, unit 2, and 3, equal to this one. This is for case 1. So all of this is for J0 is shorted to 0 ohms. That's what's happening here. So for now, this is what we are trying to determine based off this analysis. The biggest thing with this is we're looking at our. This is specifically solving for our equivalence, our voltage, our Thevenin's voltage equivalency. Right here, so based on. Our goal and how our analysis is you would do. The inverse of this matrix right here, however you want to, whether it be via Kramer's rule or by uh, doing the cofactor method of finding the adjoints and such, 3319 should be covering that on how exactly you find that. Um, in the materials as well, there are some documents where Dr. Russell does cover name and name using both methods, where he plugs it into his uh, TI Inspire, the fancy blue one, and just so it doesn't match for him, or maybe like a TI 89. However method you want to solve it for, this is what it would come out to be. Again, one, two, and three is equal to. These are the values we get. One point seven six is point eight volts. So that's what we have figured out here. And now the reason why let's go back couple of weeks or just a single page. The reason why we like attaching a load source to our circuit is to better define our behavior because the goal, don't forget, is to create an equivalent circuit in regards specifically for this problem, a Thevenin's equivalent, meaning a voltage source in series with a load component. And based off our circuit, we can examine here that our load voltage is simply going to be EN3. EN3 is what's going to be controlling our Thevenin's voltage equivalent for our ETH. And now let's go back. Well, we notice that EN3 is equal to negative 0.8 volts, which is going to be our value of our Thevenin's voltage. So now, our case two, you could say, case two, our second set of math we'll be doing is shorting out JG1 to be zero. So what that means is we are going back through again using the same map we generated earlier after doing our name set, our analysis for it, the same exact map times our Node voltages V1, V2, and V3 equal instead of our independent source of JG1, we're using our load source we attach to it, which is this vector right here. So now you would resolve it for the same exact method. Whatever method you use, you resolve it using this right here. And according to that, we get our vector, new vector, to be in 1 is equal to 0 0.1, negative 0.5, 0 volts. Okay. Well, this information is fine to any, but we'll have what to do with it. So, this is what you would do with it. Okay. So, our RTH, our Thevenin's resistor equivalence. Let's look back at it. OK, so well, first, let's we know R is just equal to. E or I, right? Ohm's law. Well, let's look at and see if we can determine our relationship or what's going on. So we know VN3 is equal to our ETH right now. We know that. Well, is there a way we can use VN3? 
in our load source to go ahead and figure out what's going on, we can. Since we shorted out JG0 in our second case, this is doesn't no longer apply. That means our controlling and only source, our only independent source is J0. And with this, since we know we're letting BN3 be our controlling voltage evidence equivalence, we can use that as well as our source to determine what exactly is going on. So we can use BN3 over J0. Well, BN3 isn't equal to our first case. It's not the first case we saw for about negative 0.3. BN3 is what you just use for your, when you short it out JG1. This is the value you would use to find your, resi your resistive equivalence. In this case, be 0 over 1. So 0 voltage over current, 0 volts. And so our final equivalence, Kevin's equivalent, is going to be this. There's going to be no resistive value, but there is going to be the source still, specifically of 0.8 volts. But we know there's something. We're, we assumed originally our equivalence is going to be the positive side. Please take into consideration your sign. Please do not forget this. It's a negative. That means the orientation we assumed originally is incorrect. That means our load is facing down. Here's the positive, here's the negative. Our terminals are still the same of A and B. And that is how we solve for this problem. So just to take it back real quick. For name, for the evidence specifically, you would use your name analysis, your nodal analysis, to go ahead and figure out how we would attach a load source of one amp specifically and determine the behavior of your circuit in regards to your impedance sources being shorted out versus your load source being shorted out and just seeing how your circuit would behave then. How I started it is I wrote our sum for our diagonal elements in regards to our node voltages being one, two, and three, filled it out, did our name setup. By now, you guys have worked out a decent amount of problems in the problem sets provided by Dr. Russell. Maybe look at his materials too in regards to the extra problems that we can work out there. And this is where we come up with our total sources here. Next step was to figure out a equivalent to separate them out, find our relationship between our dependent sources. In this case, plus it was V5 and I4. V5 and I4, here is V5, here is I4. This is passive convention, meaning anything going out of a node in current is specifically positive, anything going in is negative. And with that, we go ahead and determine this relationship here. We substitute it in specifically for our dependent source in row two, alpha VN to G4. Basically, please remember that VN is still a voltage and on the right hand side it's all current sources so you have to multiply it by your G4 in case if it's something similar to this. Another problem is you've probably seen different cases where I4 may not be just a straight times V2 they could have been maybe a difference of it but that's what those problems these ones specifically this is how it would be set up. We go through and generate our map our equivalent matrix times our nodal vector of VN1, 2, and 3. Subtract it from our original map in the left hand side. And now we have our, our independent minus our dependent in terms of our nodal, I mean our nodes. We solve for it. Two methods. We need to first short out J NOS and look at it. Our original independent source, then we short out our loads, our independent source, and use our load source to find our evidence E equivalent here. And that's how you do that problem. Our next one is something a little bit different. So this one specifically is going to be covering a little bit of both. It's going to be a main problem. It's going to be a very fun one, honestly, in my in my opinion. So let's just look at it. Let's put it together. RLC circuit. 
the moment I read ROC, I'm thinking, do I want to work in the time domain or do I want to work in the complex domain? I'll touch more on that in a bit. Let's continue reading it. So we know source driving network is an AC voltage generator with a frequency of one radian per second. So we know our frequency is just one radian per second. And our time domain expression is given as well as our intended tiny little steady state expression of V3 in terms of time, where V3m is a magnitude of V3 in volts and its phase in degrees. So let's figure out what the what does this mean? What is going on? First thing, complex. The moment I see RLC, like RLC, an RC or an RL circuit, I think, what are my phasor elements? What are they? The complex impedances, you could call them too. So just to recap, our real and phasor is just whatever this value it is, and there's no complex component to it. For capacitors, this is a little bit different. There is no real component behind it, but it would be negative j over omega c. If I were an inductor, there's no real component behind it, but there is a phase of it of j omega l. This is what you would use to go ahead and start your analysis with. So in a problem like this, one thing I like doing is writing out the impedances of what they are. So let's see how many elements we have. We have one, two, three, four, five. Five elements. So impedance one, so Z1, is going to be equal to R1, and so on and so forth. That's how I'm currently setting up this problem. So we know R1 is going to be equal to just one. This is just straight up just one ohm. There's no complex component behind it, so just one. One ohm, Z2. Z2 is specifically our inductor. So let's figure out what our inductor is. Our inductor is going to be, it's 300, so three nice whole numbers. Zero plus J omega three. D three is our capacitor, so D zero minus J over omega. Our C value is one third, so it's just one. I'm writing in the numbers just to show you guys what going on when converting these elements into their phase of counterparts. Z4 is equal to our inductor force. That means zero plus J omega. And our inductor value is half Henry. So I'm going to write in one and one half. I like, I like working with, with, with factors. And then Z5, it's a real component. It's a resistor, so it's just four. So, some of you guys might be asking, where is omega come from? Well, how our omega value actually comes from what's known. So, normally, how you would do this is there's that times some cosine value of omega d plus phase. Well, our omega, there's no value of it. It's not zero. Is going to be one. There's an invisible one here that we can see. And so is our phase. Our phase is actually zero since there's no, there's nothing attached here. There's no like plus 60 degrees or, or minus 120 degrees. There's nothing there. It's just actually zero. So let's, let's go ahead and make a note of that later. So let so me know omega is equal to one, our phase is equal to zero. And something I want to emphasize real quick too. Please do not be afraid of converting between rectangular rectangular polar and to its uh, Euler's form. So when I say what I mean that is a rectangular x plus j y, the general notation of it, our polar is the amplitude of our e to the j omega plus any phase value there 
And then yours, this one's a little bit more tricky. So it's your amplitude of your cosine of the phase plus J of the amplitude of the sine two phase. Please do not be afraid to be able to convert between these three forms. The Inspire does it really nice. It's very quick and easy with those calculators. Just please be aware on how to use it. For the people who may not have an Inspire, I would recommend looking into just seeing the setup behind how you convert these because there is quick and quick methods to do it by hand. Just to be aware it might slow you down in the test environment. I know it slowed me down since I was using my TI-84 back then, and I didn't have my hands on the Inspire. So I had to make sure I was okay converting between these three forms. So now that we know what our values are, I'm going to leave these here. I'm going to use here. And let's go ahead and start doing our analysis. So what exactly do we need to figure out? We want to find V3, the voltage across three, which is specifically our capacitor. Well, we want to find voltage, meaning we can do a couple of things. The first thing we want to point out here is our PGT is a voltage source. The voltage source, and so is our dependent voltage source. This is also a voltage source here. This significantly hints that we're going to be using main here. This is a main problem. If you were given, say, a current source here as well as here, that would indicate main. But this is a main problem. So we're going to be treating it, it like that, meaning I'm going to establish our mesh one and mesh two using the, uh, count, the clockwise convention. Clockwise convention, as the convention we'll be using here. We know now our omega values, we know our impedances, we know how they're going to work. Let's try and set it up first. So well, something I like to do is go ahead and just kind of redraw it again. You could say in terms of its phaser count loss. This, this takes a little bit more time, but it's good practice to visually see what's going on, at least when I first started learning the, the, the material you guys have seen me too. So here's our source, positive, wave, and then, so I'm just going to write out the actual blocks. Z1, Z2, going down to Z3. Here's our dependent source. Here's Z4. Going down to Z5. Dependence. All these. And now in our phaser count points. Now our sources, our sources I will touch on in a bit, but I just wanted to show you our impedance block, essentially a block diagram, you could say. We have that, and then just to make sure notation is correct, here is I2 of T, and then here is I4 of T. Here's that. So let's figure out what is going on in that. Uh, something I was forgetting. Please do not do what I just did. Please do not forget the hats. The hats is for sake of notation, essentially. It indicates, in, for us at least, for now, it will indicate it's a phaser counterpart. And this is what we're looking at. Please do not forget it. Same thing here. I forgot it. I forgot it in terms of our phaser counterparts, kind of not even in terms of time anymore. We're in the complex domain, we're in the phaser domain, whatever you want to call it. This is how we set up. This is how we set up there. I think our EG here, phaser, doing this, our dependent source, the arm times I2 plus I4. So now let's do let's do main now. So we know here is I1, here is I2. So let's look at mesh one. So we know it's gonna be a two by two. It's gonna be a two by two. Two mesh currents still be like 
And well, let's start from here. So for diagonal elements, the sum of it. So the sum of I am one is going to be the sum of our components in I am one. So it would be E one plus Z two plus Z three. And for I am two is going to be equal Z three plus D4 plus D5. That's just for the diagonal elements. The reason why I like writing it up is so that I don't get confused on what exactly is going on. And then for the bottom right hand corner, it just be 3 plus Z4 plus Z5. Again, do not forget the hats, they're essential. Now let's look at the shear component. And since it's a two by two, it's pretty straightforward. It's C3. So that means our Z3 impedance is what's being shared between our two meshes. And that's our map generated there. So now we're going to be looking at our independent, not even our independent, our source vector, the combination of it. So I'm not separating it out yet. So we look at mesh one. Mesh one, there is our independent source plus our dependent source. And let's look at it. Is it flowing in terms of our active or passive? In this case, is it following the convention we have set? In this case, our current is traveling through, traveling through. It's how it's traveling through. It's going from low to high, meaning it is going to be positive. It is following our convention, so we dictate it is going to be positive here. And then let's look at for IM2. There's no dependent source, but if we look at how a current traveling is going against our dependent source from high to low, which indicates this will be just a negative here, a negative of that. I2 plus I4. Again, please not forget the hat. This indicates in the phaser domain. And that's the reason why I didn't write the EG. With T, because we're not at respect to time, we're in the phaser domain. So now, let's figure out how exactly we're going to do this now. So I'm not going to write any value yet. I want to make sure we understand where these numbers are coming from and how they're being set up. So same thing still is applied. All we're doing is working with complex numbers instead. So what I'm saying is the same process applies. We're going to separate our source vector into both the independent and dependent sources. So let's do that now. So EG is our independent source. And there's no dependent source, I mean independent source being used for our second network, our, our second mesh, I should say. Let's look at the independent sources now. This part should feel familiar in terms of how we want it to be set up. It's just the same process we've been working with this entire time of I2 and I4. And this is also going to be negative on I2 plus I4. Well, now let's look at how exactly I2 and I4 relate to, to each other. So we know I2, in terms of time, we're just looking at it from a time point of view now. We know that here, our current is traveling across our inductor, which is equal to I2. Well, how do we figure out what, what, what's going on here? Pretty straightforward idea, I guess you can say. So we know a couple of things. We know our dependent source is related upon I2 and I4, right? Well, we know that this current of I2 is being provided from our source, right? Oh, I'm sorry. To visually, not to visually, to conceptually think about it, we can say I2 has traveled here all the way around, right? And since our resistor one, there's no real impedance, there's nothing affecting it because it's a value of one. 
it goes right through it with real with simple costs. So we know I2 is essentially equal to. So we know I2 is equal to I am one. And same thing can apply here. So assuming when only looking at I am one, I4. I4 is can you can claim the same thing here. Where I4 of T is just equal to I am two. And then their phaser counterparts is simply just I am one in the phaser domain and I am two in the phaser domain. There's no real complicated notation behind that. It's just simply still finding your relationship in terms of what you're trying to work with. In this case, it's main. We want to relate I2 and I4 in terms of our current. And this is what the relationship would come out to be. This is a two by two mesh analysis. I understand they would not be as hard as, as some of you guys wanted it to be, but I wanted this was the problem provided by Dr. Russell, and I felt like it was an adequate problem to go ahead and walk through. With this in mind, so let's go ahead and convert this one last time into its counterparts. You know, I am whatever M, which is going to be I one phaser plus two phaser one phaser plus I two phaser, and that's that. So again, we want to take this dependent map right here and generate it in terms of whatever matrix times our meshes. And we are in the phaser domain, so we are keeping it with the hat on it. So let's try and figure it out now. To a similar process, what I did last time is same thing. So I look at it, RM. RM is being distributed to both mesh one and mesh two, meaning it exists for both mesh one and mesh two in terms of the first row. The second row, same thing here, it's a negative being distributed to both of them, so I claim this. And simple as that. So now our final, our final map before plugging in the values is going to be this. It's going to be very long, just stick with me here, okay? C1 plus Z2 plus Z3 minus Rm the first cell. Next one's going to be Z3 plus Rm. Down here, I'm going to take out the negative just to make sure there's no confusion what's going on. And same thing here. All I'm doing is again subtracting the dependent map from our original resistance. Well, not this, our impedance this time. Our impedance matrix in terms of the phaser counterparts. All this times our I am one, I am two. There's that. And this is all equal to our EG in phase one. So now we still missing one last part. What is EG? In phaser. What is it? Let's look, let's take a look back at it. So we know in the time domain, EG of T is equal to 5 volts cosine P. Well, there's a couple ways you can, you can, you can do this. You can use your calculator and convert it to rectangular or, or, or polar. Or what you can do is essentially kind of break it apart by hand, you could say. So we know five is the amplitude. There's no phase. There's no phase angle. We can claim this and breaking this apart into its Euler's form. Euler's, how you pronounce it? I still don't know. I always forget it. It's five cosine of zero degrees plus j sine. Of zero degrees. 
Pwede po tingnan siya, madam. Five. Five. degrees. Which can then get us our rectangular point. And five plus j zero as sine of zero is zero, and that is our rectangular form of our sinusoidal, of our AC voltage source, I should say. AC voltage source. So now, plugging in values, officially doing that, we have everything we need. We know our impedances, we know our form factors of RM. RM is just equal to two factor of two. So let's go ahead and generate our main that we will be using. So some negative one plus j2 two plus j negative two plus j then six minus j one or j over two if you could say j over two all this times our mesh and phaser equal to our source in, in, in phaser as well, specifically in the rectangular form. That's that. Now using this, our goal is to go ahead and solve for our IM1 and IM2. So we're still doing the same process of finding our mesh one and our mesh two values. So let's move on to the next page for that. So after plugging it in, doing whatever analysis method you want, Miller's rule, using the TI calculators, finding the adjoints, and then doing the inverse that way, whatever you want to do, we will get these mesh points. And a point two minus J two point four minus point four plus J point. This is all in amps. So now let's look back at the original question. The question is specifically asking us to find the voltage for V3 in a time domain. V3 is our capacitor of one farad. It's being shared between mesh one and mesh two. So we know, in a, at least in phaser, we know in phaser, V3 should equal the impedance of our component times the current, right? And based off our convention, we know it's going to be I am one minus I am two. And that is going to be the convention and the expression we'll be using. This is in phaser, please don't forget the hats. Whilst we're saying you're, mi you're mixing both the time and the phaser domain, and that's not a good idea. So you know, knowing that, when we write again, V3 in phaser is going to be equal to our impedance in phaser of your mesh one current minus your mesh two current. Okay, and here's that. So now, putting it all together, you know, Z3, Z3, let's look back at our list. Z3 is just equal to J omega C. In this case, omega is equal to one. No, omega is equal to one. So is this essentially going to be zero minus j? Because it's just j over one times one. And that's just one. So it's j minus j. And in our mesh currents, they're right above us. So let's go ahead and put these together. Negative point. Negative 0.2 minus J2.4 minus 0.4 plus J.8. All of this is going to be equal to negative 0.2 minus J.2 volts. And so this is where, again, it's your call how you want to go about doing things. Because this is the rectangular form. And the question is asking us to get it into this form specifically. 
for V 3M cosine T plus the phase of this. So we know our angular, our omega is still going to be one. We know it's going to be one. It's safe to assume this because there's no real factor that was changing this. There's nothing dictating that our omega, our frequency is going to change. The only thing it would have changed is if we stated our frequency is being used at a different rate for whatever reason. You guys will actually cover more of that after this midterm too, since I do understand Dr. Russell is slightly behind. In regards to material cover, which is why I'm covering only two problems for this midterm review. But as besides the point, it's rectangular. Okay. So there's a couple of ways you can convert from rectangular to, to this. So rectangular can be converted between four as well as Eulers. We saw the Eulers to our rectangular earlier when we go ahead when we went ahead and figured out that. So we can actually go work a little backwards from here. Okay, so we know a couple of things. We know we want to find our phase angle. We want to find our amplitude. Well, the amplitude here, our A essentially, the amplitude, is just going to be equal to our x squared plus our y squared is going to that. That's just the magnitude of it. So we know our a value should be equal to 3.26624. The phase is a little bit different. The phase is a little bit different because the actual math you guys do to find a phase is just the inverse of your tangent of the y over. What I is. And I'm cautious of mentioning this because on the Cartesian plane, our angle we get in that in that domain may not be workable. Sometimes you have to add it by pi over two, as in 180 degrees, maybe you have to shift it over by a certain amount. I mention it with caution because not everyone enjoys learning the math behind it. So I'm mentioning it now just to show you how the numbers would like actually turn out. But ne nevertheless, our phase, our phi, is going to be equal to negative 176.4237 degrees. We have our amplitude and we have our phase. That means this is our current setup we're trying to work with. Them. 244 phase of negative 176.4237 degrees. Okay, well, we know a couple of things. Right? We know we want the real time domain. We want this to be in, in terms of time. We know this is equal to the degree in our phasing. Well, to convert between phaser and the time domain, it's essentially finding the real portion of this. So we know it's going to be real of 3.26244 of negative 176.4237 degrees. We know the real of this, of our phase, is also equal to Our Euler's form of what I mentioned earlier, the cosine of negative one seventy six point four two three seven plus the J three point two six two four four and of negative six point four two seven degrees. degrees. The reason why I bring up this form to begin with at all is just to show you how exactly I'm reaching the conclusion of V3 at So whenever we take the real of this, we claim the imaginary isn't affecting, not, I don't want to say isn't affecting us, but it's essentially not factoring it in. So whenever we take the real of any rectangular form, basically means that we're getting rid of this one. 
of our of our complex notation. So this is just equal to v3 of t. After everything said and done, is just equal to this cosine of we still have to factor in our omega, where omega was equal to one. Our t value of our omega. T minus 1 is 6.42 degrees. And that is our final answer right here. So why, why I want to emphasize the most here, I guess, is please not be afraid of converting between your rectangular to polar to your Eulers of your cosine. Don't be afraid to transfer between any of these forms. You will be seeing a lot of this throughout your e-career here at UCA as an electrical engineer as well. To recap what this problem covered, this problem covers specifically using main in terms of a of a alternating voltage source with a frequency of one radian per second. We were given the time domain expression of our source, and we're given just a very simple main problem to find our voltage across C3. The reason why I identified it as a name was because we're given our voltage source and where everything is already in terms of voltage sources, which is a good indicator that we'll be using main as main dictates that. To emphasize, please be aware of how you can transform your elements, your R, your L, and your C to their phasor counterparts. Please be aware of that. And know where that notation comes from. I really know where that notation comes from, but please be aware on how you use it. From there, break it apart there. To redraw it just to visually see what's going on, how it's functioning in terms of its impedance. And from there, you apply the same math we've been working with before in terms of main for this problem, at least. Go through, generate our map, our, our, instead of our resistive map, it's our impedance map instead. We have our mesh currents. We only have two meshes, so it's a it's a vector of two, so we're working with two by twos. And then our independent and dependent sources, same thing. We combine them at first, break them apart, however you if you see they're then separated out already, by all means go for it. But I'm going through here showing you guys the math, showing you guys the work, showing you how you how you convert your current. I mean, your, your sources in terms of the Euler and polar and the triangular showing you how it functions, going through, doing that, then finally plugging in our values here and solving for mesh currents in terms of, its, of their phasor counterparts, then finally converting it back over to real time domain, which gets us our voltage across three as an alloy capacitor. And I do understand that there are some other concepts that we will be covering we that you guys could potentially see. So let's just show you what they are. So we know our resistor, okay? We know in terms of of it in series. So we know for our R symbol, the in series is just, you know, whatever many is just R1 plus R2, however many there is, right? Same thing for parallel. For parallel, it's essentially total is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, or you probably may have seen this equation right here as well. Just remind that which one you would use for several for a way. Why I wanted to mention is this way. There's a relationship between your inductor and your resistor. Now, not many people may have realized, as you show the symbol, little snake coil, we saw that here as well, to show you what it is. And we know in series, our inductance total is the same method you would use to find the resistive total. It's just the series of it and just the summation of it, and then our L of T, is also equal to just one over one over L, one plus one over L2, however many there is there. Our capacitor though, is what you would see as the difference of them. 
it's essentially flipped your notation for like a faster in series is what you would use for resistors and inductors in parallel. P2 and then how many you have. Same thing for in parallel versus what you would expect for the in series of resistors and inductors. Just wanted to mention that real quick. You guys do you have some problems covering that. The materials are a great resource, and please, by all means, look at them. Take what you want from them. I'm not saying use every page Dr. Russell provides you, just use what you are comfortable with. Have your homeworks ready, as this is an open notes exam, as he always does. Please be familiar with these notation and just go ahead and make sure that you know how to convert between the phasor elements to the real to the real elements. Understand that for Thevenins and Nortons specifically, with Thevenins, you'll be using name with a current load source. And for Nortons, you would use the name and apply a voltage load across it. You go and go through your analysis, same as usual. The biggest thing is you have to be wary of what you're shorting out to find your equivalent. Your equivalent in regards to the Norton's and Thevenin's final component equivalents, whether it be for Thevenin's, it would be a voltage load, I mean, a voltage with a load resistor in series, or Norton's, where it would be a current source in parallel with your load. With your load. And that about wraps up this midterm two review. Again, we apologize for being kind of late in regards to when how we did it last time. If you have any questions, by all means, just email me. However, we have Blanco. I'm on Discord. I'm not in the I'm not as active in the Discord as I want to be, but I'm still there. Email me at my office hours, Mondays and Wednesdays. You know where I am. I can leave the room or across the hall and be silent. But, anyways, that wraps up this midterm two review. I do hope everyone does well and find this, this review useful. And I will see you guys in the final midterm review here in a month or so. I will see you guys around.